So let's talk then, friends, about uh, what anarchists are saying and the case that they're making um, about uh, the way we should see society. Uh, what's the anarchist, as it were, analysis of the world that allows them to be optimistic for an overthrow, a complete overthrow of uh, the orders in our lives that are sustained um, through the threat, the implicit threat or the overt threat um, of violence. Anarchy ultimately is the absence of order. And on this um, one point alone, uh, Graeber and the IR theorists that we mentioned before would certainly agree, but this is where the agreement ends. For IR theorists, as we were saying a moment ago, anarchy is a liability, it's a problem to be overcome. Whereas for anarchists, it is a benefit. It is the very absence of government and leaders that provides the absolute freedom in which individuals can finally flourish, come to govern themselves, and learn finally to live ethically. And um, it might be helpful once again here to think briefly about the boys on the island in, in Lord of the Flies. Um, there's a way of looking at that movie that says, well, at first it was working, and the only thing that stopped it working uh, for the boys uh, was that they were children who didn't know any better. And we took lessons from that film, of course, but what we forgot was that they were just children and were adults. And maybe adults, at least we would hope, would have a better chance. We might fare better. And indeed, for David Graeber, this is precisely the point, because he has, is sort of academically trained as an anthropologist, and he would be very well aware of the examples from around the world, um, both historical examples, but also current examples of primitive peoples effectively living as sort of what, what he calls baseline communists, right? That, that is to say, you know, because obviously we tend to think of communism as being to do with the Soviet Union and things like this, but this is not what Graeber assumes baseline communism means at all. Baseline communism means that just simply you're living in a very horizontalist community uh, without any hierarchy, without any sort of sovereignty or implicit threat of violence or overt threat of violence, uh, if you misbehave, right? But instead, uh, especially if you look at, for example, traditional peoples living on the island of Madagascar, you find these very sort of consensus-based forms of government um, where people take turns being leaders, uh, people take turns um, doing various tasks, jobs, and they're highly actually democratic, which is kind of funny because we don't think of traditional peoples as being anything other really than sort of very hierarchical uh, beings. And uh, what Graeber is sort of trying to do is argue to us that in fact that's just simply not the case. So the anarchists say it is possible and um, there are uh, three main reasons why. And here they are, liberty, self-organization and power. Um, Let's talk about liberty first. The anarchist uh, assumption about liberty is that it's, um, and it's, of course it's the, it's the core assumption of a right-wing ideology as well called libertarianism, um, but is that we should maximize freedom as much as possible. I mean, to the maximum extent possible. Um, now, libertarianism, interestingly, uh, takes this to what I call the meatloaf approach there's a meatloaf song called i would do anything for love right and of course the song in the lyrics he says i would do anything for love but i won't do that so you should or could if you want think of libertarianism as a type of anarchism um now why would it do why would it be fair to say an ideology would do anything for freedom but it won't do that. Well, that's where we identify the key element of libertarianism, which is that libertarianism wants a lot of the things that anarchists want, and they're very similar ideologies, um, but anarchism wants to get rid of the state, which of course is the ultimate entity that uh, dangles the threat, or not even the threat, but actual use of violence over us to coerce us into behavior in the final instance. And libertarianism wants to keep that because libertarianism believes that that's the only way the security of our property, which is our ultimate right as individuals, can be maintained. Does that make sense? So libertarianism wants to retain property. 
and the way to secure property is through the sanction of violence through the state. So this is a very uh, much, very much a theory grounded in the work of John Locke, if you remember our early work on John Locke, which we covered in our module on liberalism. He also believed that the state should be a minimal state, but it was an advancement over the theory of Hobbes, who said that the state should be like an absolute dictatorship. Um, anarchism, you know, is further removed again from Hobbes because it believes that we can be our own sovereign citizens, so to speak, and we don't need the police, we don't need the army threatening us with violence, we're, we're, we're capable of being well-ordered, we're capable of being well-behaved and living again in relations of mutual aid uh, and self-government. Um, and so this is where we uh, move into point two here, which is that there's a natural human capacity for self-organization for people like David Graeber. It's been proved time and time again. Humans are basically decent beings. If you put them in a situation where uh, they are able to be decent beings and the way people are able to be decent beings is when they're not threatened with violence, right? When they're not debased and um, and de de when they're not debased and when they're not subjugated um, by violence. Um, so uh, we see many examples of this in nature as well, right? Uh, we see geese migrating for the winter, taking turns in the lead position. You see these mighty V-shaped squadrons of geese sometimes migrating in the wintertime in the skies over our heads. And um, we note that it's not always the same goose in the front, right? They take turns. The strongest does it uh, until it can't anymore, and then someone else takes over. And it's very cooperative. There's no leader. There's no squadron leader. There's no one barking out the orders. They just take turns. It's all very cooperative. Similarly, we can think of examples in our lives where we might have seen swarms of bees or flocks of swallows, and it's hard to see that they have a leader. I mean, bees obviously have a leader, um, but uh, swarms are not necessarily being barked at by the queen, right? The, there's a self-organization element to it. And certainly with swallows, it's very hard to see any kind of leader. Um, you know, Jordan Peterson talks about hierarchy among lobsters. Um, but even among lobsters, um, uh, even among lobsters, you, which would be Jordan Peterson's point, and if you don't know who Jordan Peterson is, by the way, just forget I mentioned him, but even then, you have these uh, potentials. And um, the lead lobster or the boss lobster, the, uh, the lobster that somehow occupies the, 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 the point of hierarchy, or the queen bee, um, it would be very hard to say that that person had authority in any sense that we recognize. Like, it's not that they have some kind of charisma or anything like that. So they're not authorities in the sense that we use the word when human beings use the word authority it usually means like a sort of a moral or uh, ethical uh, person or our core or center to to administer the rest of us so that's very very important i think to recognize and then finally uh, the thing that makes anarchists optimistic is the fact that life within the state ultimately corrupts power because there's a struggle to achieve the power of the state to retain the power of the state and of course in even if we're the most left-wing revolutionary in the world or something like this if our revolution is to seize the power of the state then of course the state can eat us up right like it can um, make us the thing that we hate we may have the best of intentions in our say communist revolution or socialist revolution if old school revolution of some sort which would have been carried out through violence. But once we have power, we need to keep power. And to keep power, we become anti-democratic, right? We, we instead use violence and secret police to suppress any dissent. And, and that's the tragedy of revolution, as a lot of scholars will explain, like Theta Scotchpole, for example. So um, we have this potential then for, for an optimistic life without power, Traditional libertarians, just to, to reiterate the point, will direct their protest to the sovereign state. They'll say, like, you know, you've got to protect our property, whatever have you. And um, they will ask for increased security of property. They'll ask for freer markets. Anarchists, on the other hand, don't appeal to the state at all. They prefer to disregard the state completely and indeed 
sort of will take their so-called direct action even against the state where needs be because they believe it's a fundamental source of the corruption of our human nature. Uh, human nature is uh, very, very different for an anarchist than it is for Hobbes. For Hobbes, the state of nature is, and I just reiterate this because it's so important, for Hobbes, the state of nature is um, the thing that reveals the ugly aspect of human beings without order. Like that as animals, we are animalistic, <laughs> uh, but um, kind of more like uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, anarchists have an optimistic appraisal of human beings in the state of nature that it's actually order. It's actually the state, it's sovereignty that makes us ugly, right? Because we want that power. We want, we want to sort of play the game of the pecking order within it. And, and we then will like step over anyone else to get to the top. And that, that is a tragedy. Um, so we need to snap out of that tragedy. And, and uh, the way that anarchists are going to try to guide us, uh, give us tutelage to achieve these goals is through what they call prefigurative politics. So bookmark that concept in your heads for a minute because it's a, moment, it's a concept we're going to get back to in a minute, uh, prefigurative politics. But it is critical that we get one point here. And, and Graeber is calling for a politics of what he calls new anarchism. And we, we need to think about what that might mean. We're going to get to prefigurative politics in a minute. But let's just talk about, as a footnote here, new anarchism, um, because it's important. So what is new anarchism? It's, it's an idea that basically we're going to try to be experimental. We're going to try to further apply the principles of traditional anarchism. And so um, it, it's, it's in recognition. Um, new anarchism is in recognition that, again, you and I in our ordinary lives are already probably somewhat anarchistic. Again, because we tell children to share their toys, uh, because we help our neighbors. Um, uh, so new anarchism is... Is, is a little bit different to traditional anarchism. Hmm. It's, it's, it's a rhetorical point, I suppose, but it's important uh, because it's asking us to take stock of and to recognize um, the, the ways in which we are already uh, anarchistic or communistic in our ordinary everyday lives with each other. So uh, for Graeber then, how do we take these ideas to their conclusion? Um, how do we further apply uh, the, con the, 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 uh, the, the precepts, the principles of, of anarchism. Um, here we go. Um, horizontal direct democracies, sometimes tiny, sometimes large groups of self-organizing people, like that flock of swallows, like th those migrating geese, like the swarm of bees, you know, um, have wisdom. You know, we can call it the wisdom of crowds. You hear that term sometimes, because even in capitalism today, a lot of people talk about the wisdom of crowds. So sometimes tiny groups, large groups, whatever have you, do historically engage in all kinds of leaderless behavior. You think about your your own neighborhood, for example. Um, maybe you have seen your neighbors or people in your community have organized a cleanup um, of the street. I know growing up in Ireland, this happened from time to time, all the neighbors would come out and everyone would just like pick up trash, you know, just to kind of make the neighborhood look pretty. Um, was there a leader? Uh, was there a contract? Did everyone do it? No. Um, but there was a general commitment to it and people did it. And on the same strength of that idea of being able to do things without leadership, um, uh, Occupy Wall Street uh, came together in so-called general assemblies made up of thousands of people who had decided and who would decide on a daily basis how to occupy together. Now in the checklist for this module I'll be providing you guys with some links to um, videos that explain some of this stuff uh, or demonstrate or model some of this stuff for you so you can watch those videos um, for uh, yourself and and again the links will be in the checklist now looking at the second point here which contends or pertains to what we call utopian prefiguration or just if you want to put it different, differently uh, prefigurative 
politics. Um, as the name suggests, this is about the future, right? It's prefiguration. Um, however, um, now, like it's living the future now. To prefigure means to figure in advance. Um, sometimes artists use the word foreshadowing, which means like if I, in a play, I'm like making a little remark early on in a play that's going to signal something to come, right? And so we can signal that thing to come. That's what prefigurative politics is. We can signal the anarchism to come, if that's the ultimate evolution of humanity and our species, by taking direct action and living that other world, that future world, today in the present, um, through peaceful, nonviolent means. Um, so it means that rather than waiting for somebody to wave a magic wand and for some future revolution that may never happen, uh, waiting for everyone to be on the same page, you're just going to go ahead and, and do it, right? You're just going to go ahead and be an anarchist and live an anarchist lifestyle right now. Um, and this idea then of, of, of doing direct democracy now was central to Occupy Wall Street. Um, they tried to implement their utopian ideals in the here and now, right in Zuccotti Park and in Liberty Square on Wall Street, even though the American state that they want to abolish because they want of course to abolish every single nation state on earth um, would continue to operate itself through principles of representative democracy so you have obviously our normal american representative democracy or canadian or british or australian representative democracy continuing but uh in this little enclave of that park people are just doing a different thing right now that obviously doesn't necessarily mean they're in conflict with the law enforcement officers right. or whatever um, it, but it's a kind of a protest right it's it's kind of modeling or trying to demonstrate a kind of a leadership to the rest of the world around you that this other world is possible and this leads us then to our final point uh, which may seem trivial um, but it can be trivial you right it, it, ethical common decency is just being nice to each other um, you know some of us on a daily basis do this already, right? You know, we, we don't jump ahead of the queue. Are we open the door to let someone who looks weaker than us through? Are we give up our seat on the bus for an old lady or an old man? And all Graeber is saying is that, you know, that's a baseline of human behavior already, and we can take it to its logical conclusion uh, by extending it as a set of principles to our politics. And if we do it, he argues, it requires us to rethink um, what behavior looks like in our political lives. Uh, it causes us to rethink really what we actually owe to each other in terms of our humanity. And uh, it's important because of course it leads us to think about debt and what debt means and where debt comes from. So let's talk about that now. Now, uh, rethinking the meaning of debt is the topic of Graeber's 2011 book, Debt, the First 5,000 Years. And this book is um, arguably important, uh, not only because of what it says uh, about debt and what debt and indebtedness mean. Um, and of course, how debt sort of prefigures, and the history of debt prefigures this notion of the 99% as sort of being a a general historical category, not just a category that exists under capitalism, but a category that exists, you know, a long time before capitalism. There's always been the poor people. It, if you read the Bible and Jesus is constantly talking about the poor and the poor being with us constantly. And of course, Jesus uh, drove the money changers, the bankers out of the temple, didn't he? You know, so you could argue there's a certain primitive communism on Jesus's part as well. Um, and uh, the whole argument there about the rich man and the getting into heaven, having a greater chance of getting through the eye of a needle. Um, so there's, there's some merit to that kind of argumentation, and it speaks to the deep historical presence of poverty, the deep historical presence of debt uh, as well. Um, so where's what happens in this book? It's a huge book, uh, David Graeber's book. Again, it's called Debt, the First 5,000 Years. If you want to read it, it's a cracker. Um, it'll take you a long time, but you can browse through it. It's, it's one of those books you can sort of dip into. But his argument in the book basically goes as follows. You know, you, you, bo you borrow, say you borrow $1,000 from a bank to buy a used car. And adding up the loan and the interest on the loan over the term 
of the loan, you can calculate exactly what your debt is. And this is very simple and straightforward in some ways. And it's very beneficial to both the borrower and the lender that this can be achieved. Now, Graeber doesn't deny that debt can be useful to both the borrower and the lender. I mean, debt is a way of people with money to get money to people without money on terms that are advantageous to both, right? You know, um, the person without the money needs it now um, and can do something maybe productive with it. The person who has the money is just, just sitting there, right? So they want to invest it and get something as a return. Now, uh, what Graeber wants to sort of think about is, is whether the debt is really as beneficial to the borrower as we think. And his argument goes something like this. Debt is a debt because it is quantifiable, right? And this makes it, and, and he says, this is a quote, simple, cold, and impersonable. I said that wrong, excuse me. Simple, cold, and impersonal. The loan officer at the bank is only interested in your ability to pay off your loan. He's not really interested in who you are, what your story is, uh, why you need the loan. So for example, you might need the car that you're buying, that you're borrowing the money for to get to classes and maybe to get to a job on the side. Uh, or you might need it to travel to your low-income parents on the weekends to care for them because the in-home support that they have from the state only covers them during weekdays. And the loan officer in the bank, he doesn't really want to know any of that story, right? So he has no real idea of like how important that debt is to you. Like some, some people need debt for some things, other people need debt for other things. And some people debt is trivial. Some people debt is like vitally urgent, right? And so that personal aspect is not really considered in our, the way the market functions to think about debt. So um, to use sort of more technical language, the loan officer has no idea of the human effects of the loan, uh, what, what economists call externalities. They're just calculating in simple quantitative terms what you owe them and what the bank will get in collateral if you don't pay off your debt. You know, they'll get the car, in other words, because uh, if you don't pay off your debt, they can seize the car. So debt then is calculated, we can say, in quantified terms. It's calculated in terms of money. It's impersonal. It's cold. It's nothing to do with you. It's nothing to do with your story. It's nothing to do with your human life, right? So now we know how the bank sees the debt. Let's think about us as the borrower. How do we experience this debt despite this impersonal nature? Well, let's go back to the example of the car. Let's suppose you start missing your loan payments for some reason. Uh, because maybe gas prices have gone up or tuition prices have gone up or you got cut back in your hours uh, at work or you have to care more for your parents because their health is deteriorating. Now you're faced with a problem. You can't pay off your debt. And because of this, others will most likely see you as failing, not only financially, but interestingly, morally. Now that's an interesting turn, the argument, isn't it? Right? Now we don't think of it as immoral in that instance then, for the bank to repossess the car if you can't pay off your debt. In fact, most of us will think it's immoral for us not to pay the debt. And in that sense, then your inability to pay back the debt is, is immaterial. Money is money, a deal is a deal, as, as Graeber argues. Except that there's a problem here insofar as a deal is not always a deal, at least not for everyone. History shows us that debts between equals are not the same as debts between people who are not equals. Uh, and you can see this very clearly, I think, um, in the financial crisis. Wall Street banks were bailed out for technical reasons. They, in other words, had their debt forgiven. Um, and that wasn't thought of as immoral. The failure of the banks to pay off their debt was not thought of as immoral. But the failure of poor people to pay off their debts, um, you know, uh, people on welfare, what have you, we do judge them. We judge their lives. We judge the shitty clothes they're wearing. We judge the shitty house they're living in. Yeah, you know, the, the banged up car they're driving that's falling apart. We judge all that and it's seen in moral terms. So uh, the uh, leads us to a quote, uh, debts between social classes, between the rich and the poor, suddenly become a matter of absolute morality. And he says, this is a pattern that's as old as time itself, right? It goes back 
to the time before Jesus. And this is the problem for Graeber. Despite the evidence um, that those in power very quickly drop the language of morality um, when it suits them, when they have to deal with their brothers and sisters at the top, right? Bail out the big banks, in other words. Most people today still believe that paying your debt is not just a financial or a technical obligation, but a moral one. Think about that for a second. So the banks make technical failures and then we bail them out and we don't see it as a moral problem. You and I make a failure and it's not seen as a technical failure. It's seen as a moral failure. Big difference, right? And we need to think about why that's so, right? So debts are calculated in terms of money. Money has the capacity to turn morality, this is a quote from David Graeber, into a matter of personal, impersonal, excuse me, I'll start again. Uh, money has the capacity to turn morality into a matter of impersonal arithmetic and by doing so to justify that would others that which would otherwise seem outrageous and obscene to to take a matter of morality and turn it into an impersonal arithmetic just to re-emphasize this and in so doing justify that which would otherwise seem outrageous and obscene i.e. to repossess someone's house, to repossess someone's car and stop them visiting their invalid parents on the weekends, etc. So money is the issue here. Uh, if it can be expressed in money or in money terms, then considerations of morality become quite relativistic. It's at the end of the day, those in power who get to say who owes what and who doesn't owes what, who is guilty of a moral failing and who is not guilty of a moral failing. Now, if you look at the relationship again, that pint of milk that you borrowed from your neighbor last night or the little bit of sugar or the flour that you borrowed, the eggs, whatever have you, because you didn't want to go to the store or you didn't have time to go to the store, um, you know, those are debts between friends. Debts between friends are never really worked out in pure calculative form, are they? Right? And the reasons why. First of, all, first of all, because friends are those with whom we share the information that banks are not necessarily interested in, right? Uh, the, we, whether it's our neighbor borrowing from us or us borrowing from our immediate neighbor, um, those neighbors know our story and they're invested in us as human beings and they know we might be having a hard time or I know they might be having a hard time. So I, I know the human story um, and I actually know much more about whether they're successful or not. You know, uh, I know much more about what they're up against. I know much more about the context that they're working in. Um, and there can be some empathy in that, right? So that's one reason why the debt between a friend is different. Secondly, though, we share these bits of information that don't fit into any calculations of debt with our friends because friendships themselves are incalculable. So there's something transcendent here about friendship itself. And if we didn't do that, we wouldn't have any friends, right? So think about that for a second. Like, you know, you do not go around in your friendships. I mean, you, you, I mean just any one of us, even the greatest advocate of capitalism in the world will admit this. You definitely don't uh, treat your friends as debtors the way a bank treats a debtor as a debtor. Yeah. Uh, if you did that, you'd be screwed. So, so first of all, then you have that empathy thing that, you know, they, you have proximity to these people, you know, their stories, you know, their lives, you know, their context. But then secondly, you, you also have a concern about friendship. And if you ran your friendships like a bank runs a bank, you'd be done, right? So this is what we're talking about here. It's an ethical common decency between friends. And in many ways, we extend this also to complete strangers. This goes back to the waiting in line for the bus, for example, not jumping the queue. And this is what Graver calls baseline communism. Each of us takes from others according to the needs that we have and gives to others according to our ability. And that's an old Marxist idea, I suppose but it's also the baseline of communism. So the example of how we treat our friends and strangers shows us that debt can be rearranged. We do it every day. Um, you can't get me the milk today, just get me t tomorrow, right? Uh, unless I really, really need it, it's no big deal. It's just a pint of milk. Um, I can handle it. If I couldn't, I wouldn't have lent it to you in the first place. Um, yeah, just get it to me when you can. So the example of how we treat friends and indeed strangers often um, shows us that this baseline communism is possible. Okay, so now we've talked about um, the math. We've talked about how the bankers see it. 
uh, in an impersonal way. We've talked about how it gets very personal when it's us dealing with our neighbors and, and often with strangers. But we also need to now to talk about violence because violence is a big part of the debt story and it manifests itself in, in two ways. First of all, there's the obvious way it manifests itself. You know, if you can't pay your debt, it your stuff's going to get seized, right? Reappropriated or uh, um, seized uh, in a kind of a foreclosure sense. Um, your car, your home, uh, your your reputation. My God, I mean, you have a debt rating. We have debt ratings that we need to think about. And um, that, you know, almost more than anything, you know, your moral standing in society, th these, are, these are not trivial matters by any means. Um, and your friends will judge you, your family will judge you for all of that, right? And the bank has the option of even going to the police to make sure that your car is seized. And so that's the obvious way violence works. It's sort of overt, violent coercion. Um, and that's in our lives uh, as a sort of a coercive shadow at the end of our, at one end of the spectrum of our relationship with debt. There's also another sort of way that violence is part of our lives with debt when it affects people who cannot stop repaying their debts, right? Because, you know, uh, we in a society, financialized society, where we're borrowing now for everything because wages are so low, may find that we're sort of just living perpetually in service of debt. Um, we're trying real hard to get ahead, but we're spending half our lives just servicing debt to make a basic living. You know, you go into debt to get the opportunities, and then when you have the opportunities, you spend 90% of your income paying off the debt that you took out, the extra debt you took out to pay that opportunity. So in this sense, then, we enter into a society that is sort of not just threatened by violence for the debt that we have until we pay it off, but a society that threatens violence just for living. <laughs> you know, so we're renting our lives, right? That's that's really what it means to live a life of debt, an entire life of debt. It's kind of like a debt servitude. <clears throat> oh, that's one of my favorite images. I forgot that was in there. <laughs> this is an occupier, Occupy Wall Street guy. This is an image that went viral, and this was his protest. Shit is fucked up and bullshit. Right. Now we're going to move on here to uh, just a little bit. I'm not going to go super, super into debt, uh, debt, <laughs> debt, depth on uh, the film. Just a few things to say, and then I think you'll get the point, and um, you will certainly uh, see the connections with David Graeber's argument. Um, so the Hunger Games, part of the background of the Hunger Games is that once upon a time, there was a district that uh, rebelled, and that district now owes a debt that everyone is responsible for. It's, to, it's a sort of a way that the capital, which is the central um, system of the Hunger Games, the, the capital, uh, you know, elite city, um, they, uh, in a sort of a futuristic version of the ancient Roman Republic, have this kind of fealty or loyalty that uh, is due to the capital every year um, as a sort of a debt for sins of the past. And it's a way, of course, of preventing rebellion, right? You know, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a way of sort of constantly reminding, reminding people, like, if you rebel, this is the fate that awaits you, right? And of course, I think that that district even got nuked, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, it's a while since I've watched the film. Um, but uh, here's the quote from the Treaty of Treason. In penance for their uprising, each district shall offer up a male and female between the ages of 12 and 18 at a public reaping. These tributes shall be delivered to the custody of the capital and then transferred to a public arena where they will fight to the death until a lone victor remains. Henceforth and forevermore, this pageant shall be known as the Hunger Games. And we see in here the voice of a character by the name of Seneca Crane, uh, played by Wes Bentley. He's the game maker of the annual Hunger Games, and he's interviewed by a guy played by Stanley Tucci, uh, the character Caesar Flickerman. And in this interview, it's broadcast across the whole of Panna, the, the world that they live in. Um, and uh, he gives this sort of history 
of where the Hunger Games came from, uh, how the 13 districts, the colonies, have to kind of give this fealty to capital. And, and interestingly, Panem, right? Think about the, uh, the word for a second. Uh, Panem is a Latin word, and it means uh, bread. Uh, and it's reminding us of the Roman um, 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 fights that they arranged in the uh, in the in the in the big um, gaming arenas that they had, where uh, tributes would fight to the death. Um, and this was the Roman emperor's way of entertaining the people. And the motto was to give them bread and circuses, panem, meaning bread. So there's a strong linkage then between the the movie and the sort of inspirational. It's 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 more than a hint, you know, that uh, that, that there's a there's a linkage between what's going on in the Hunger Games and what was going on in the in the ancient Roman um, uh, circuses. Now, um, at the beginning of the film. Uh, we meet Katniss, and she laughs at her friend Gail when he says, well, and this is making us think a little bit of uh, The Truman Show, right? Um, it's almost a direct reference to The Truman Show when you think about it. But Katniss laughs at Gail because Gail has said, you know, what if we just stopped watching The Hunger Games? And, and she thinks that this is the most delusional idea on Earth. And why? Well, because even though... She herself is defiant of the capital's authority uh, because, of course, she cross, crosses the district border. She understands that what's normal in the Hunger Games is for the capital of Panem to rule absolutely in an unquestioned way um, over all its residents, the residents of the various districts. So in this way, she's very conscious that her own actions, her own um, transgression of the rules is like an exception. Like she's sort of saying, I do this, you know, I'm the transgressor. I, you know, I'm not into leading a rebellion or something like that, right? You know, this is, that's, that's not something that I expect everyone to do, number one. And nor do I think even if I sat down and had serious conversations with people that they would do it. You know, I, I don't know how you would even lead that, right? So that's why she's laughing, right? Because most folks will continue to watch the games regardless. And in that sense, of course, she's the proof of the rule, right? They say the exception proves the rule. Well, Katniss Everdeen, I think, is is um, is clearly that case. And the contrast with the Truman Show is, is quite stark. Truman's life is also in a way similar to Katniss Everdeen's life because his life is governed too. But Katniss and her people aren't just ruled. There's a difference between the Truman Show and the Hunger Games. And that is an economic issue because, of course, these games are structured in a way that Truman's life is not. The Hunger Games have this creditor-debtor relationship. So the annual pageant, then, the Hunger Games sort of hangs over this film as distinguishing it from Truman Show, um, the capital and the district relations are creditor-debtor relations. Every year there's the reaping and the districts have to pay this moral obligation somehow, right? They have to pay their debt to their failed, uh, in memory of their failed rebellion to the capital uh, with the lives of their children. Um, what would be deviant in this instance then is for this relationship itself to be to be opposed, to be reinterpreted, to 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 be deposed or revolted against, um, and even Katniss in her transgression, she's only really transgressing as an individual. You might even say it's a consumeristic type of behavior, right? She she's kind of just choosing to identify herself a little bit differently. Um, it's kind of a fuck you thing, if you'll excuse my language, right? So um, this leads us then to. Um, to think about uh, some other things, including the role of um, Donald Sutherland's character, President Snow. Um, Snow is an un under no illusion about the nature of this relationship. He makes it very, very clear. He reminds his audience of previous times when districts have tried to question the authority of the capital. And he's not hiding this from anyone, right? He's saying freedom has a cost, right? Your prosperity, your lives have a cost. You may think your existence is pretty shitty, but believe me, you're doing better uh, with us maintaining this order than you would be without it, right? Again, echoing things we've said previously in this lecture about Jordan Peterson, people like that. 
and that cost, the cost of freedom, is of course the Hunger Games. Now, now, be grateful that this cost exists, right? Uh, everyone benefits at the end of the day, even maybe the victims of the Hunger Games, arguably, right? So, so why has Panem articulated this relationship in terms of a debt? After all, the districts, the revolt of the districts that revolted was in the past. So. So surely this isn't a debt, surely this is a punishment. Um, well, the reason why you would say it's not a punishment is because to articulate it in terms of punishment would be to say that it's personal, right? Uh, you attacked me, therefore I'm now looking for my pound of flesh. If you remember from your Shakespeare, uh, Shylock the merchant wants his pound of flesh, right? That's an eye for an eye. That's a, that's a you owe me money, so now I'm going to take a piece of your body uh, kind of idea. And that's personal, right? Um, that's a very kind of overtly moral way of looking at it. You know, I'm saying like literal pain is the token of exchange here, right? You owe me money, you can't pay it, I'm going to break your kneecaps. In other words, I'm going to make you suffer some pain. And there's a relationship being established between an amount of pain and an amount of money or material goods and services that you owe me, right? We're saying there's an equivalency there. So um, that won't do for Panem because that looks bloodthirsty. That looks kind of mean and it looks kind of barbaric, frankly. And if Panem wants to exist as a civilized society and, and claim the legitimacy of being a, leg as a civilized society, then it has to have this appearance of everything being kind of above board and that it's not personal. In fact, it's objective, it's dispassionate. So we run this scenario then through what we've been talking about with David Graeber and the Hunger Games does the exact same thing, I think, that the banks are doing with us as debtors, i.e. turning morality into a matter of let's use the word we used before, impersonal arithmetic, turning it into a cold, impersonal thing, uh, and in doing so, justifies things, as we said on the previous slides, um, that would otherwise seem outrageous and obscene, right? And so, to be clear, this shit is really outrageous and obscene, right? You know, the Hunger Games justifies the conversion of the district's children into a form of currency, cash currency, accepted by the capital, and then forces them to fight to the death live on television in order to safeguard the future peace and prosperity of Panem. And if you object to it at all, um, then there's the policemen, the white policemen that come for you in their white suits. Um, they will meter out state violence on you. Uh, they will take care of you. They will sort you out. They will, they will coerce you. And let's be honest, none of this would be possible without the economic enforcement uh, that the state can only wield. So this is then, in a way, uh, a good metaphor for our own world post-2008, right? We've also been engaged in a kind of a Hunger Games. And the same maneuver that Panem uses to persuade us that this is just is the same maneuver used by our banks to justify that our debt is a moral debt. Meanwhile, of course, they let their friends off the hook, right? Yeah, but that sh don't don't mention that, right? That that we we're not supposed to. That's just a technical necessity. Um, it's not a moral issue at all. So um, both Panem, the world of Panem, and our world are quite different to the idealized world of anarchism, where we would all treat each other as neighbors and friends, with, to borrow again from David Graeber, ethical common decency. Um, so says the president. Okay, so um, let's move to our, our last uh, slide here, guys. Um, Katniss. Let's talk about Katniss. Um, her father died in a mine explosion, and she's angry with the system for that because the mine wasn't safe. And she believes that people are being forced to work in these mines in unsafe conditions. And so she has had to then, in the wake of the death of her father, take care of her mother, who's depressed, and her baby sister, who doesn't really have the wherewithal to look after herself on her own. So Katniss is very skilled at hunting. And of course, her father taught her how to hunt. So there's some justice 
there, I suppose that she can use that skill to continue to provide for the family. And we see that in her transgressive ways that Katniss Everdeen appears to be a little bit like an anarchist. And there's two ways, I suppose, in which we can say that's true. First of all, in the words of David Graeber, because she's acting as if she's already free, uh, because she defies the capital's laws and rebels against those laws. So she is definitely engaged in what you might call prefigurative politics, right? Let's use that word we used earlier on. And also she uses anarchist principles of self-organizing, mutual aid, uh, through her relationship with Gail. Um, they go hunting as a duo, as a team. Uh, they're leaderless, of course. Um, they work for the benefit of themselves and their families. So in their own little, little way, um, they have a horizontal organization between them. But it's not clear that when Katniss goes out to hunt and uh, engages in these actions and, and follows these motivations, that she's engaging in these uh, what you might call anarchist practices for anarchist reasons. And we, let's think about what that might mean. Um, remember, David Graeber is asking us to become new anarchists, right? To extend that primitive anarchistic or communistic impulse that we all have anyway and turn our everyday, ordinary, quotidian communism into some kind of political program to get rid of the nation state. And Katniss is explicitly not into that. She is not a revolutionary. She's not chasing some grand ideal about liberty or totalitarianism, right? Is it to save her sister uh, from being picked? Yeah, right. She wants to protect her sister. She sees her sister as innocent. And so she feels kind of different obligations here, you know, one to her sister and then the other to the capital's demand, which, of course, she's willing to honor. She's going to put her own body on the line to honor the capital's demand and thereby spare the life of her sister and the, the trauma for her sister. Excuse me. So how does uh, Katniss understand debt? She understands debt in the way uh, that Graeber describes debt, certainly, as an obligation that is impersonal and, in that sense, a corruption, right? Because you can't really express debt as math and use violence to back it up. Right. In fact, what you're doing there is pers is really punishment. And so she sees it for what it is. And this is the way anarchists want us to see it as well. Right. She hates it. And she sees the arena as a total fiction, a total fraud, a total spectacle. And so she kind of is in willing to play the game, but she's also refusing to play the game. She enters into the game in the film. Uh, certainly she's in it. And um, but she won't do what everyone else does, which is seek sponsors. But why? Because then she would owe things to them. And in her fierce independence, she's kind of just like, I'm not getting into any more debt here. I don't want these quasi moral, violent relationships hanging over me. N enough of that already, right? She's done with that, right? So, you know, there's examples of um, PETA uh, and bread, you know, she doesn't understand friendship the way David Graeber does. She believes that um, you know, she owes PETA uh, for the bread. And in this sense, then uh, she doesn't see the. this is this is um, uh, something that has to be paid back. Um, the bread, of course, wasn't something PETA was giving to her as a social obligation. It was from his point of view. He was a neighbor. He was a friend. He was giving the bread because it was the right thing to do. But she can't. She's so like lost now in the debt mindset that she can't even distinguish between what a neighbor does for a neighbor anymore. And that's a very different relationship than the debt relationship she has with the capital. So if I've explained that well, then you understand that Katniss is actually really sort of psychologically in trouble here as well as everything else. And in this sense, then, if we started to start thinking about the trilogy of the Hunger Games, uh, really, it's a story about how Katniss comes to grips with the fact that social obligations and calculable debts, i.e. the relations between neighbors and the relations between you and the violent state, are not the same thing. Some things you have to do because they're right, because they are what David Graeber and the anarchists would call basic decency. Um, so that's one way to certainly look at the story. But then we have a kind of a mystery. 
a final mystery to resolve about this movie, and that is the suicide pact at the end. Now remember, the capital does change the rules of the game. Uh, change the rule once to allow them to win as a couple. And that's unusual for the Hunger Games. But then, in a double unusual move, the capital changes the rule again to require them to kill each other at the end. And in the end, their decision, of course, is not to play this game. Katniss is absolutely com committed to not having debts to anyone, and she doesn't want anyone's death on her conscience. So mutual suicide pact is the solution. And in the end, their decision to kill themselves is uh, obviously very much an act of prefigurative politics, right? Because they are acting as if they were free, free of debt, free of debt in this powerful, very powerful, very symbolic way. They're going to give their lives uh, on their own volition uh, in order to be free in that final minute. It's the final act of freedom. She's refusing the impersonal logic of the rational debt by saying no. No, this is wrong, and I am willing to die. I'm willing to do the right thing right here and now. I'm not going to listen to the voice in my head that says what's right. This matters to me. It matters a lot. It's personal, right? And this is how she becomes, ultimately, through this act of prefigurative politics, this massive, massive symbol for the districts, a symbol of defiance against the morality um, of the debtor-creditor relationship that have structured the relations of all the states of Panem, all the districts of Panem, since the end of the rebellion. But, and this is, I think, where Cynthia Weber makes a great point, let's revisit her motivations one more time. Because, now, to be sure, I think we can say it goes without saying uh, that she is clearly someone who exposes the fraud of debt, and she is clearly someone interested in prefigurative politics, she's someone interested in uh, transgression against the state um, and she's an anti-authoritarian you might say so she's definitely some sort of anarchist she's in that anarchist spectrum you might say but remember earlier in the lecture that we said anarchism had a close brother a cousin uh, intellectually called libertarianism and communitarian anarchists are those who strive for the common good they protect excuse me, they protest against the impersonal logic of the state and try to expose how it affects them collectively. Individualist anarchists or libertarians, if you will, direct their protest to the state because they think the state can secure their personal self-interest. So let's try to think about Katniss in relationship to this spectrum. Um, Cynthia Weber argues, and I think this is interesting, just because a person battles for their private liberties in public does not mean they are battling for the public or are constituting a new public like the 99%. And for me, this is very reminiscent of the neo-Marxist argument that we encountered in, when we looked at Hart and Negri and the multitude. And it might be useful to think of them here because they recognize that in order to achieve democracy, we have to have a struggle in common. There has to be something that we're all in it together for. And that is, we have to identify not just with the 99%, but with everyone, um, the so-called multitude. Um, this is, uh, I think, another way of saying what Weber is trying to say. And Katniss, at the end of the day, the, the test, uh, she, all the way through the movie, in many, many respects, is acting like an anarchist, acting in a way that David Graeber would be very impressed with. But in the final instance, certainly in the first film, it's clear at the end, if we revisit the script, that if the myth is that there is such a thing as the 99% and that we are the 99%, <coughs> certainly that is not true for Katniss Everdeen and she doesn't actually embody it. So there you go, guys. What a pleasure uh, uh, recording this uh, last lecture for you. Uh, again, uh, this has been a real treat for me this semester. I've learned a lot from working with you guys very grateful for the opportunity. Moving forward, uh, we are, uh, this is the last uh, lecture of the semester, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, you'll be hearing from me again uh, in the days to come uh, with a study guide. Um, you'll have a uh, video study guide for your final exam. The final exam will be the same format as the midterm, 
And uh, so look out for me in the coming days. Uh, I'll be releasing the assignment and I'll be releasing the, the accompanying video to go with that. Uh, so uh, stand by, keep your eyes peeled on your email, keep your eyes peeled on Blackboard. The announcement for that will be coming very soon. And um, that's all I can say for now. You've been great. Thank you very much. And uh, any questions at all, feel welcome to email me uh, or reach out. Uh, we can uh, meet in person. We can meet by Skype if you have any issues at all or you need, need any help with research. Okay. Thanks, guys. Take care.